This week's episode is meant to give undergraduate students interested in law school some insights into what it's really like. The lawyers as seen on TV are not necessarily representative of the real experience of studying law or becoming a lawyer. Today, we hope to dispel some of those myths by interviewing FAO academic writing and applications coach Iwei Jin. Iwei has a master's in political science and Asian studies from the University of Toronto and has recently finished his first year of law school at U of T as well. Iwei has also spent time working as a research fellow for the Asia Pacific Institute in Vancouver and is a talented writer, researcher, and academic. Welcome to our podcast, Breathe In, Write Out, Iwei. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me on. My name is Iwei. Um, I'm excited to talk about law school. Cool. As incredible <laughs> or incredulous as that may sound. <laughs> Um, so you have a lot of different academic experiences. You've been an undergrad, you've been a graduate student, now you're a law student. Um, what have you observed about the difference in these different degrees? Um, like before I answer, I probably should contextualize my answer is that um, I studied political science in my undergrad and then I also studied political science in my graduate degree. Mm -hmm. So my experiences are informed by those, ex like, you know, the, the limitations of those programs. Uh, and I also just finished my 1L or first year at law school. So what I say is going to pertain only to those um, programs. Uh, but in general, I would say that uh, grad school is actually not that different from the upper years in undergrad degree because, one, we share a lot of similar courses. Um, right. Uh, in, in graduate school, at least for me, I had a lot of undergrad students in my classes. Yeah. Um, so that's one. Um, the content is actually not that different. The, the one difference I would say is significant is that um, there is a lot more independent research going on in grad school. Mm -hmm. um, undergrad is more about sort of literature review, if that makes sense. Yeah. You're sort of like surveying the field, right? You're taking notes, you're not really developing your original ideas. In exams and essays, you're really summarizing what other scholars positions are yeah um and in grad school the f focus is more on research methodology and is on exploring your own research interest and conducting your own research or, right. and that, I, I would say that is the biggest difference um in terms of law school it's kind of weird because law school is it's a at the law school it's law students like to say that law school is like high school just because <laughs> of how um especially in first year, just because everyone takes the same classes and uh, the, the examination system where um, you're, you sit down and, you know, let's say three hours or four hours and you just like write until it's finished. It's very similar to undergrad exams. Yeah. Um, it, so the evaluation system is kind of similar to undergrad. And in one hour you take the same courses. So that's very, also very similar. Yeah. But I think once you get to two or three L, you start to have seminars and you have uh, research courses and you also do more practical um, experiment, uh, experiential uh, learning. Mm -hmm. so in that sense, it's more similar to graduate school. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. So what, how, how did you do your first year? I know that a lot of people say it's a big shock to the system, law school, because it's very competitive and there's high expectations and you have these long exams that you have to study a lot of material for mm -hmm. and it can be very stressful even for like top students it could be a stressful experience yeah I think the main reason behind that is that law student or law school in general are quite selective in their um, admissions process mm -hmm. so what happens is that people who are used to being the top students in their class all end up in the same school and now they're competing against each other, right? So, and the law school structure is such that you're graded against the other law students. Right. Um, so your performance in school depends on how much better or worse you're doing compared to other similarly situated, also very smart, you know, academically overachieving students, you know, those, those like type A students. So right. that's where the, stories, the, the stress is coming from. And I think, you know, it, it's natural in a sense because you are, again, structured and, and compelled to compete against other uh, very strong students. 
Yeah. But at the same time, I think it's also about setting reasonable expectations of what you can do and cannot do. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I would say is that it is a shock to the system, but it doesn't have to be if you're um, reasonable about it. Yeah. yeah. So what, what did you do to be reasonable about it? Or were you not reasonable? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I would like to say that I did okay. Um, like mentally, I think that's one aspect of law school is that you have to really take care of yourself mentally. Mm -hmm. um, not just because of the course material, which is indeed very intense and you have to read a lot uh, compared to even right. graduate programs. I think the readings that we had to do was more than what I had to do for my master's. Wow. So, so there's that. Um, so the time management aspect of law school is something that needs to be um, taken care of, but also just in terms of being realistic about what, you're, what you can achieve. Um, against other law students, I, I think you have to sort of like set your expectation in terms of what other students are doing, right? If you're competing against other top students, are you really gonna be, you know, above average? Like if you said that your, your goal to be, I'm gonna be performing at a similar level as my undergrad or graduate, um, Right. programs, then I, th I think you're kind of setting, setting yourself up to failure just because it's, you know, it's not going to be possible for the majority of the students. Right. So that's something to be aware of. Mm. So a, a B is good in law yeah. school. Yeah, it is pretty good. Average is good. Yeah, I remember <laughs> even when I was in graduate school, I took a law course as one of my graduate school courses and they generally graded about one grade lower than what you would expect to get in your master's program mm -hmm. so it's just just a lot harder um what what's something that surprised you about the legal profession or law school once you actually got in there okay so i'm not someone who you know knows a lot of lawyers and in my personal network, unlike some law students. Mm -hmm. So, you know, getting into law school is around the time that I started to learn. Or, you know, around, like, Didn't when I started thinking about law TV? school. Didn't you see <laughs> lawyers on TV or, like, read about lawyers or hear about lawyers? Yeah. I mean, I, I was aware that those are TV lawyers and, <laughs> and movie lawyers. Um, I, I did watch some YouTube videos about, you know, made by other law students, sort of, like, telling us that these are not a typical, what a, a law student would typically experience. So okay. I was aware of that, but I really started to like ask questions, you know, to lawyers and trying to find out what lawyering is like around the time that I started thinking about applying to law school. Okay. So it was kind of like a late experience for me, but I did realize that there's a lot of diversity within the field. Mm. Um, when you think about lawyering on TV, it's kind of the same, right? You have to right. be standing in court, making a strong oral argument. Right. Um, but that's not the majority of what lawyers do. And different types of lawyering require different kinds of skill sets. Right. Uh, and you have, you know, for example, transactional lawyers who uh, really work on sort of like the behind the scenes stuff, like drafting uh, regulations or drafting legal memos or Mm -hmm. um, not really going to court that often, if at all, right? And then you have, you know, lawyers who practice at the appellate level who are mostly making legal arguments, um, but not really dealing with uh, witnesses or evidence. But that's something that trial level uh, lawyers do a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So even at, in court, you have lawyers doing different stuff that require different kinds of skill sets. Oh, uh, a lot I, of, I didn't know that. Yeah, so that's really interesting to me. And that I think maybe a lot of people are not aware of that when they think about lawyers. Yeah. Yeah, it's like when you, when you ask someone who's an athlete, you wouldn't stop at knowing that they're an athlete, right? You, you, you'd be interested in knowing what kind of athlete they are. Yeah. And like a golfer would be very different from a basketball player, for example. Right, or track and field. Yeah, yeah. well, I knew lawyers, because my dad's a lawyer, but he, does, he did mostly like, uh, he was more like a solicitor. So, you know, in England, they have, and we still have that distinction here, but when you graduate here, you're a solicitor and a barrister. But in England, there'd be barristers that go to court and solicitors that do the paperwork. And sometimes in trials, you know, usually a solicitor and a barrister like partner up. But here, those two skills are kind of put together. 
But my dad mostly did paperwork. He didn't like going to court. So I knew, I, I mean, I knew it's not like on TV, but I, I really think that's interesting. I didn't realize that appellant uh, lawyers, so these would be like the lawyers that go to the Supreme Court or whatever. Yeah, or, you know, like appellate courts in the province. Yeah, yeah. like the Court of Appeal. They're not dealing with witnesses and, and whatnot mm -hmm. to this, the same extent as right. um, lower level courts. Yeah, like because by the, time, by the time that the case gets to the appellate level, the, the record is already set. Uh, mm -hmm. to a large extent, right? You don't have disputes over what's admissible and what's not, right? You, you have already a factual record in front of you and just making legal arguments. Yeah, and something I didn't realize, because I actually went through a, I was actually a witness in a, in, in a court case once, and I didn't, I didn't realize that they have to go to the judge and argue that this should actually be put on trial and then the trial occurs. So there's like several steps. Mm -hmm. So if someone committed a crime and you reported it to the police, there's a lot of steps and a long period until they actually appear in court, which is depending on what it is, which is not what you see on TV at all. Yeah. Yeah. Someone can be in jail for a long time <laughs> waiting because they can't make bail. Yeah, um, that, yeah, that's a, definitely a very serious problem. Uh, I think the average is, uh, I'm not sure what the average is, but you, you have people waiting in bail or in remand for as long as several years before they yeah. get their hearing. It's depending on the, especially if it's a more, I think if it's like a more minor thing. I think that happens a lot with immigration stuff. I don't know. I'm just, this is just based on what some of my friends tell me in stories but i know that's uh yeah that's a problem um can you imagine that you're waiting yeah. in jail yeah if you think about the position of the years yeah it's for your case to be tried and at this point you're legally innocent right you, nothing has been yeah. proven yeah yeah that's yeah. crazy yeah, and that's not like a serial killer. That's like, yeah. uh, I don't know what level of offense you could call it, like maybe theft or something, I don't know. Um, mm. So how do you think the law school application process is representative of what you actually do when you enter law school? Um, if we think about the law school application process there's two parts as far as I can remember there's like the LSAT and then there's the personal statement yeah um I think these are the two I'm not missing anything am I I don't think so yeah so the LSAT and, and people who who scored higher on the LSAT may, may think that you know it's, it's somehow a demonstration of their merit but personally I don't think it's such a accurate um, assessment of whether you're fit for um, studying in the law school. Mm -hmm. I think maybe the reading comprehension section is similar to the extent that you also read sort of like unfamiliar passages right. uh, in law school and you read cases, right? If you read, let's say a business transaction case, you're not gonna be knowledgeable of the specifics of the, you know, what, what happens in that specific business. Right. Um, so you you are asked to glean sort of what the main takeaways are from a long and very often uninteresting uh, yeah. case, and, and you're sort of asked to do similar things for the reading comprehension section in the LSAT. So I think that's there. There are some parallels there, uh, but the personal statement is something that I think is more useful uh, to think about, both because. Um, it's a useful skill set when you think about job applications after law school and during law school. Um, yeah. Being able to construct a personal narrative um, and, and write within the limits that you're given is a valuable skill set. And I think there are a lot of parallels in that sense. Right. And I, I think something people don't know is even like some of my friends that are trial lawyers, before they go to trial, they write very long submissions. There may be like a box of files and submissions and evidence and whatever that they prepare before they even go to trial. 
so writing reading and writing definitely mm -hmm. seem like the the kind of backbone yeah. and i have heard that uh, courts are also very strict about word limits mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> and it's something that's a part of the personal statement as well so yeah all right cool so how do you think your previous um, educational experiences or work experiences prepared you for law school or maybe they didn't? <laughs> like you said, right, reading and writing is pretty basic and, and it is a part of what I did before in grad school and in my work for, uh, uh, for example, I worked for a think tank and we wrote a lot and, and we were given time and word constraints when we wrote and I think these are all all very useful experiences. Um, one of my professors from last term actually said that, you know, the, the words or written words are the, the stock and trade for lawyers. Right? You, we deal in words. Yeah. That's the commodity. So yeah. writing is definitely very important. Uh, and I would say a specific kind of writing is explaining, mm -hmm. explaining complex ideas concisely and accurately. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a very specific kind of writing as well. It's not just, you know, writing in general. Yeah, it's but. different than graduate school because I actually have, um, I have a number of PhD clients and one of them uh, has been a practicing lawyer and she's finding the opposite. You know, she can write well as a lawyer, but then learning how to write as an academic mm -hmm. is a different kind of thing. Yeah. So. That's an interesting point. You're learning a different communication style within a community mm -hmm. of professionals. Um, no, you, you kind of mentioned that everyone or a lot of people are, have that A-type personality. So do you think there's a personality or skill set that really uh it's valuable to have in law school i think it's a tricky balance right I, on the one hand you want to have some baseline level of competitiveness or you want to have of course you want to have high expectations of yourself and be motivated enough to 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 actually do the very difficult work that is required of you yeah um, and again it's not a yeah it's not an easy program to just coast through um there's a lot of work to be done yeah. and at times it can be very stressful. So there's that, right? There's this, you know, self-discipline that you have to have to be successful. But at the same time, it's easy to get burned out if you're too focused on achieving the highest level mm -hmm. achievements. Uh, and it's easy to feel that, to, to feel disappointed and, and to subsequently not be motivated. Um, as well, so uh, there's a fine balance between, I, th I think that, you know, be, be sort of relaxed about and realistic about what you can do and then also think about, or, or rather being motivated. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I know, so you talked a lot about like discipline and studying and what's required to sort of do well with the material, but isn't it true? Like, it seems like there's some sort of social aspect that's important to law school, right? Don't, don't you, aren't you actually put usually into like a cohort when you enter and there's different clubs and social activities mm -hmm. and this kind of helps or plays into um, people's abilities to network and get summer positions or position after law school. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about your experience with that or what's that like? For us, this year has definitely been very different yeah, just well, because of COVID, COVID. <laughs> and everyone is kind of just like an image behind a screen, right? And and yeah, a lot of times you don't have that organic networking or or you know whether you call it connection making or just making friends. Um, yeah. That typically happens in the law school. Right. Um, one thing I'll say is that it's important not to let the com competition or the competitive aspect of law school overtake your relationship with your cohort. Mm -hmm. And people have always talked about, oh, you know, like law school, some students are you know, competitive to the extent that they would uh, undermine other students to get right. 
Yeah. Yeah, if you watch that show, I don't know if you've seen it, How to Get Away with Murder. Mm. I can't even watch that show because it's just it's like they're so mean. Yeah. They're, they're in the same group working for the same person, but they like deliberately kind of sabotage each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, definitely that's a no, at least for me. I, you know, you're going to be working in the same field with these classmates, right? You know, it's important to, if not, and I do think that helping each other is also important just because there's so much work to be done that right. it's impossible without help. Right. right. And, and the, the source of help is going to be your cohort. Mm -hmm. And to, you know, being competitive to the degree that it undermines your relationship with the cohort, it's going to undermine also your performance as well, just because and now you're going to be on yourself. How many people are in a cohort? How many people are in a cohort? Uh, for my school, I think it's around 200 students in first year. Oh, oh, wait, but is that like your year? Like there's 200 um, people in the year? Or yeah, in the year. First year. Yeah, the first year, 200 students. But then don't they, div I mean, maybe they didn't do this oh. before, but don't they divide you into small groups? Yeah, there is a small group course. Um, oh. And again, I don't know if this is accurate for um, like a typical year, but for, for this year, uh, I haven't found the small group to be like a, a core group where people make uh, significant relationships within that group. I, I feel like people just make friends anyways, regardless of, of that structure. Mm. But maybe in a more typical year, that's different. But that's kind of the intention, right? Yeah. So you kind of have a group. Yeah. And then the you talk group. about, yep. Sorry, the small group is about two, uh, 20 students. Okay. Yeah. Like a small class. Yeah. And, and you see, uh, see those people a lot more often just because of the nature of the small group. Um, mm. Yeah. And then do you, so you mentioned like you can't get everything done on your own. So do you kind of organically form study groups? Yes. And, and sometimes people form study groups by themselves. Sometimes the school will have sign up programs where you can sign up to be in a study group and then they'll assign you one. Mm -hmm. um, but typically people are in the study group because otherwise it's, I would say it's impossible. Like what do you do in a study group? Read different things and then present to each other? It depends on a study group. Some study groups like to just meet up and discuss uh, their understanding of the readings. Some mm -hmm. study groups do work more closely together and they'll divide up the readings and, um, and, and assign, assign note taking, for example. Oh, yeah. But there's different degrees of cooperation that you can do. Right. Yeah. So this kind of challenges the idea that you have to be really competitive and, you, and it's like all about your own skill set in law school that actually there's a lot of collaboration going on. And, and this goes back to the whole thing about law school being high school is that people are in the same school 24 seven, right? You're gonna develop a reputation if you're <laughs> unwilling to work with others. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I know you did a little bit of moot court, didn't you? What, what was that like? A bit of it. Um, it was interesting for me because I, Personally, I'm not a, I wouldn't think that I'm a strong public speaker um, and I'm, you know, I struggle a little bit with speaking in front of others. Yeah. And this is something that I was aware of before I came to law school and I thought maybe I, it's either something that I need to um, be aware that I'm just not good at and therefore I need to avoid when right. I think about where to practice or something that I, that I can get better at. Yeah. Um, depending on what's required of me, right? And, and I think through the moot court, um, process, what I learned is that there's different styles of advocacy. And again, you don't need to be that type of lawyer that puts on a show. Yeah, that puts on a show that's really eloquent, so to speak, right? That that's where like gives a speech in front of the whole court. Right. Um, that's not the only effective way of advocacy. Um, mm. And you, you can be thoughtful, you can be pensive, you can, you know, think, take some time to think before, uh, before speaking. Right. Um, and you don't have to speak in a loud voice and you know, that kind of stuff, I think, are sort of some of my takeaways from doing move, uh, move court. So what did you learn about yourself? Did you feel more confident about your public speaking skills? I would say that I, I found that I can do it um, relatively competently mm. um, if I am prepared enough. 
and, and typically, you know, in in a in a situation like this, you would come prepare. You would have written the factum, and you would right. have practiced many times before you even take the stand. Right. So there's a lot of. Um, it, it's not just standing in front of others and just like start speaking. It's not right. that. Uh, which does give me a lot of comfort. Um, yeah. Is that a required thing? Does everyone have to do moot? Or was it like um, an extra thing? It's not a requirement for first year, but it is a requirement for second year. Mm. I just did it in first year because I wanted to see if I can, if but I'm going to. Like you're done, you wouldn't have to do it again? I, I would have to do it again, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so... You know, given that you've gone through one year of law school and you're good at helping people with applications and stuff like that, uh, what would you recommend to students who are thinking of law school? What should they consider before applying? So I think this question is partly like, what should they consider if they're in the process of deciding, is this something they wanna do? And then the second part is if they've decided what should they consider when they're putting together their application or right. choosing schools? Right, I'll, I'll speak about the first part of the question first. Um, when they're considering whether they're, they should go to law school, um, there, there's two things to consider. The first thing is the cost of law school. Mm. And, and is this both the financial and the personal cost? You know, what's the average cost in Canada now? Do you know? Uh, I'm not sure what the average cost is. I know that school is different differ very substantially in terms of tuition. I know that U of T has the highest, it's like 30K plus. Oh, crap. Wow, um, it just keeps going up. Yeah, Oscar is 20K plus. Um, is there I any know, that are still like 10? Yeah, I think UBC is around that range mm. uh, in the teens. Um, not sure about McGill. Is it, when you were doing your own investigation, I don't know if you just decided I'm going to U of T, I'm not looking at anything else but did you uh did you ever think the cost reflects the quality of the degree or or it's just like is that something someone should think about or overall pretty much most universities you get a good quality degree um it's just your own opinion it's it's, it's, <laughs> it's a it's a difficult thing to say because <laughs> Law school is a professional degree. At the end of the day, yeah. you're, most people go to law school to get a job, right? right? But getting the job and the ability to get a job and the, the ability to, to or, or the, the school's quality of education is not necessarily correlated. Oh, that's right? Just because you got an amazing education, legal education, doesn't mean that you're gonna be competitive in the job market right. necessarily. Um, and, and schools are aware of that, right? And so, again, I think it's a market thing. So it's not necessarily- the, 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 the more expensive degrees, people are paying for it because- A better prospect to- resources to help students get jobs or the degree carries more weight. Mm -hmm. The degree carries more weight in the job market, particularly in the more lucrative fields of practice. Um, so for example, U of T is expensive because students do intend to, like typically they go on to Bay Street and they make money afterwards. So, so there's that consideration going into the tuition. It's not just because the education is like three times better than that offered at UBC. I, I can say that that's definitely not the case. It is the, the more intangible aspect of, okay, what does that degree actually mean when you take it around, right. apply it to jobs? So that's something someone should consider, I guess, right? What's their yeah. long-term goal? And this is something that I was going to say after I, I, you know, talking about the financial cost of law school is that you also be, need to be aware of what you're, not just whether you're interested in, in practicing as a lawyer, but what kind of lawyer you're interested in being, right? If you care about social justice, you want to, you're not just about making money. Right. You need to be careful about thinking about sort of like, okay, it's, this is the kind of investment that I'm putting in and this is the return that I'm going to get. Right. And is getting an expensive education worth it or is, is, is it enough to just get a law school degree somewhere else where, where it's you know, more uh, affordable? Right. Yeah. That's a good point. So other than the financial aspect, what are some other things you might want to consider? 
I say talk to as many lawyers as you can find, um, which is what I did. Because again, like I said, what people think of being a lawyer is very different from what an, being an actual lawyer entails. Um, talk to law students and, and ask them about their experiences and whether going through law school is something that you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think I think those are the main ones that I would they that I would think uh, would be helpful. And so, what 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 part about talking to lawyers made you think, yeah, this is maybe a good fit for me? Um, for me personally, it's the ability to work with clients and and to sort of be um, because I came from an academic background. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's really the difference between theory and practice. Um, and I think lawyers do speak about making an actual impact on their clients' lives. Right. Right. And, and that is something that is attractive to me, um, but which might not be the case for someone else. Right. Is, and, there, is there a particular yeah. law, part of law you're currently drawn to? Um, I, I'm thinking about immigration and refugee law, and I'm also thinking about employment and labor law. And both of these practices are about, you know, these are very tangible things, right? These are very tangible persons that you're going to be helping with. So that, that is appealing to me, but for someone, and this is, this might be typical of a lot of um, would be law school applicants is that they say something in their personal statement, like I'm interested in the intellectual challenge of law school, or they're interested in the, uh, the, the theory of the law. Mm. Um, and my, my personal take on that is, is that, maybe there's something more that you need to have um, mm. to, to actually go through with law school because again, it's, it's a heavy financial and personal cost. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know like, um, I've always been interested in the theory of the law and most of my research when I was in grad school was about that, laws and policies. Mm -hmm. But having, and when I was younger, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, but Having um, grown up around a lawyer and a bunch of other lawyers and kind of know what they do, in the end, it seemed kind of boring <laughs> to me. And I do remember, but I do remember one time I asked my dad, why did you become a lawyer? And he actually said, though, he said, because I love the law. And I took this Canadian politics, this was an undergrad and like legal theory something and I thought this is the most boring thing in the world <laughs> like we had to like read cases and I, yeah. I was like this is boring and then I knew this is not what I want to do yeah I mean having an interest in the theory of the law is definitely helpful but I would say it's not the only thing that you know or, or you need to have something more than that right because if you're interested in the theory of the law then there's other things that you can do. There's other programs that you can yeah. do that are cheaper, that are shorter. In a different department. And yeah. then just take some classes over there. Yeah. But I don't think he was saying he was interested in the theory of the law. I think he was actually interested in the law. Right. Like, I, because, you know, understanding the law, you can apply the law in different ways. Or how does this... So I think he was more interested in that as opposed mm -hmm. to, like, how you create laws and you know that kind of thing the more legal scholar stuff um and then what about so what if someone's decided you know i want to apply to law school that's what i want to do what kind of advice would you have for them when they're thinking about and like putting together their application um are you speaking about choosing which law school to apply to or what well, to I mean, do when you're putting the application process. okay I think for the choosing the law school part, again, I, I would say talk to the students who actually studied there. Don't mm. put too much stock in the brochures. They'll say that they have certain programs, but you know, it, the reality is that different programs will have different uh, support levels. And, right. and sometimes it, you know, on paper it looks nice, but in reality, maybe it's not as good as it's held out to be. Right. So definitely talk to the students, especially those who are studying or interested in the, in the fields that you're interested in mm. that's one thing um but when you're once you're you've decided on which schools to apply to 
this gets into the more technical stuff of like how to put together a good application. Yeah, how much um, weight should you put in your LSAT score? Like, would you recommend people redoing their LSAT a few times till they get a good score or? Um, it depends on, there's information out there on the internet about, you know, different schools have different ranges of what they would consider to be a good enough LSAT score to at least be competitive. Yeah. Right. Um, so definitely look into that because different schools do have different standards. Um, let's say a, a 160 might be good enough for some school, but not for others. That right. kind of stuff would be helpful. Um, but this is the, you know, the schools would like to say that they're holistic and they, they look at everything. Um, but nevertheless, they still have, they, they still include LSAT within the tools that they do have. Right. Um, and I think that's, that says something about the school. Um, you know, the decision to put, the, to, to continue to use LSAT as a method of assessment. Um, so I would definitely say that take it if, especially if it's not in the range that the school is, um, adopting right. and take it more than once, right? I took it twice. Some people took it three times. Yeah. Um, and it's important to strategize about how long, you know, like when you're thinking about law school applications, because the outside only takes place during certain intervals, intervals, right. so you can really give yourself enough time to retake it. Right. Um, you know, so yeah, retake it if it's not good enough. So really you should start planning your application process, what, like one or two years before you want to actually go through the door and start the program? Yeah, because it takes time to study for the LSAT too. And it, yeah. you know, so I think the typical range is around six months. Mm. Um, and this is extensive studying. Um, and for some people it might be longer if they don't have time, so. Yeah. Because you have to do a lot of practice. Mm -hmm. It's not like typical studying, like get the information, yeah. spit it out. It's yeah. like you have to practice learning how this exam actually works. Yeah. It's not something that you can cram. I'll say that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's like driving mm -hmm. or something where you have to learn a skill. Yeah, it's muscle memory, essentially. Yeah. So there's that, the LSAT component, and then what about like the statement component? Um, what, what are maybe three things that could help someone to write a stronger statement? Three things they should think about. First thing is to not be redundant. Think about what you're submitting to the law school. I forgot that we're also submitting transcripts. So yeah. <laughs> that's one thing that I missed, right? But something, if something's already in your transcript, you don't need to say it in your personal statement. You don't have to say that, you know, I have strong analytical skills if your LSAT is like 170, for example, right? Yeah. That, that stuff is already there. What's the top score you can get on the LSAT? Uh, 180 is the top score. Okay. Yeah. And oh, 170 okay. is like around 97 percentile, I think. Okay. Yeah. So if you had that, is what's the high, what's the highest you've seen for like minimum requirement for school? Um, I don't know if schools have minimum requirements. Um, like on the high end, maybe one sixty. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah. It, it it depends on because the schools do say that they're looking at everything holistically. So right. if you have really strong aspects to your application that that can really help you, um, then maybe you have you can have a lower uh, LSAT score. Yeah. A lot of students coming out of undergrad who are applying to law school don't have that, right? In yeah. which case, what you have is your LSAT score. Um, right. So. Score and grades, certain GPA. What would you say is the typical GPA a law school would sort of expect or you kind of see with your cohort? U of T is a little higher, I would say. And I don't really know what the average is because I don't talk to other students about their <laughs> grades. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's on a high end. I think, I think you need to, you know, if, if you want to be um, confident about your chances, right? Like, I think maybe... 3.7? Yeah, 3.7 is around, around that ballpark, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of similar to grad school. 
Yeah, I think so. If, if, you know, if it's something that you can apply to grad school with, then I think it's something that law school can take. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so back to the statement. So we got the technical stuff, a solid yeah. LSAT score. Hopefully you have a, a good GPA. And now you're writing the statement. Mm -hmm. So don't include stuff that's already in those mm -hmm. two areas. Right. So what are two other things? Uh, one other thing, and I got this from, uh, I think someone else who was um, talking about it is that when you write personal statements, um, you need to have evidence to back it up. Mm. Anything that you write can't just be a, a, a bold statement. Right. Right. You can and, tell the story. Yeah. And preferably, you can tell the fact without making a statement about it. Right. Right. Um, otherwise, it's going to seem both braggy and unsubstantiated. Yeah. Well, it's like we always say in creative writing like, show it, don't say it. Mm hmm. Exactly. So if someone is sad, don't say the character's sad. Talk about the tears running down their cheeks and the cloud of whatever, you know? And then the person knows they're sad. Mm -hmm. And the okay. third thing I would say is that, you know, when you write the personal statement, think about the qualities that will make a good law student and a good lawyer. Mm. And, and these are, you know, like detail orientedness, uh, teamwork. Um, Critical thinking. Critical thinking, time management, so like being able to do multiple things at the same time. Right. Like experiences related to those qualities would be really helpful to bring up. Um, so yeah, I, I say structure your essay or personal statement around those qualities. And how, how did you kind of come to that list from talking to other law students before when you were going through the application process or reading online or what? Um, I for, there was this podcast I was listening to um, when I was in that process of ap applying to law school. Um, and, and the host of that podcast do talk to law school admin about what kind of stuff they're looking for. Um, I can't remember the name of that podcast. I, I could probably uh, look it up later and then have it attached to the description yeah, of this podcast. Yeah. 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 So just to sort of on that point, is there any book resource that you would recommend to students considering law school? I mean, it could even be a novel. Mm -hmm. Like, what are some good books? If they are going to law school, <laughs> the summer before law school is when I would say that, you know, don't read anything. Because <laughs> you're going to have lots of readings coming your way. And then, you know, it, it's good to relax before Fun law school stuff. starts, right? Yeah. Read fun stuff. Yeah, so read fun oh, stuff, that's for sure. And, and the, you know, different people have different fun, you know, uh, books that they read for fun. But for law school, I think one thing that you can read before law school is, um, there's this book that I read before law school and I think it, it was helpful. Yeah. It's not, um, so definitely don't pre-read any case and any like textbooks. Yeah. Um, because the reason, the, the reason why I say that is that Law school requires a specific kind of analysis that you apply to each reading. And without that, that method of analysis, reading it is not, you know, you're not going to be able to glean the important points from that reading. Mm. So you're going to have to end up doing that again anyways. Yeah. But um, you, there is this book uh, called, I have it written down somewhere. Um, it, I think it's called The Law School Book. Let me just double check. It's called The Law School Book, uh, Succeeding at Law School. And oh. it's written by Alan Hutchinson, who's a professor at York um, Law. Oh. And it basically is, a, is in law school orientation in book form. So oh. it tells you um, the structure of how, how, how you're evaluated in law school. It talks to you about what kind of writing and reading you're going to be doing. It talks to you about some important um, theories of the law and some cases. Hmm. Uh, so it's just a I, I think it's a nice starting point if you are anxious about okay law school is a really new thing for me I don't know what's going to happen uh, read that and I, I got that from a local library so I think it is available pretty widely yeah uh, yeah and it, it helps with understanding what 
law school is about. Um, and yeah, I guess it might help even if you're not sure if you want to go. Yeah, definitely. Or definitely. You can get that book. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a cool resource. I also, let me see if I can find it. I actually have a book that's for writing for lawyers that one, here it is. Yeah. One of my previous clients actually ordered this for me because he, he uses it. He's a lawyer. It's called The Legal Writing Handbook. Uh, this is an American book, I think. So some of the stuff may not apply uh, in Canada, but it's good. It's got different analysis, research, and writing techniques. It's by Laurel Curry Oates and Anne Enquist. I'll put it in the link. But just to give an example, like it tells you how to draft different things. The statement of facts, drafting an issue statement. It even talks about understanding your audience, your purpose and conventions. So it really breaks down all the different types of writing uh, you would have to do as like a practicing lawyer. So this is something to look into. I don't know if there's a Canadian version of it, but those are two good books. Thanks a lot. You know, I like to mention books. <laughs> so thanks for uh, being on our podcast today, Iwe. Yeah, thank you for hosting me. It was a pleasure to, uh, to talk about this. Uh, and yeah, I, I think it's going it's to help some people at least. Yeah, I hope so. So you can find out more about Iwe on our website, www.bao.ca. He is um, a writing coach here. He's an editor and he also does some work with applications. So check him out. And otherwise stay tuned for a short meditation and writing exercise.